folk, I might say, but for the sake of the recording. Um, so the word dichotomy, particularly in the contemporary humanities, immediately raises red flags. Um, and it's going to prove no different in the ancient humanities. It's going to turn out that something that looked like a very clear disagreement and a very clear mistake by someone who might be regarded as the father of naturalism, uh, Aristotle, uh, is actually not so easy to make up your mind about once you properly surround it with the conceptual context in which uh, Aristotle was writing his seminal works on uh, for what we would now call philosophy of mind or psychology and ethics or the study of human behaviour or rightness of conduct. Uh, so let's try and set some context and see how this apparently simple dichotomy stacks up once we've got into the framework of mind that we ought to be in to intelligently read the students' notes that we now call um, De Anima and other of Aristotle's writings. Now for those of us who work in academia, to have our to-be-published textbook totally reconstituted from students' notes would fill most of us with some kind of dread and trepidation. Uh, but nevertheless, we have no choice when it comes to delving into the writings of the ancients. At some stage, it's, sometimes when we're writing it, it's very obvious that what we're getting are fragmentary notes from what was a continuous discourse. Other times it's not, because whoever redacted it has done a very good job of restoring the continuity. But nevertheless, it's something we ought to keep in mind. And these two authors who recently published on recovering scientific writings from uh, before the Common Era makes us caution to draw our attention to the problem. The exact theory professed by a given scholar may be difficult to recover. Now that's not only because of the fragmentation of the records, it's also because the way we ask questions is so framed by our contemporary way of looking at and in our contemporary way of looking at things, we have a developed idea of, particularly in the scientific realm, we have a developed idea of functional anatomy. That for every anatomical part of the body that we can individuate, there is in fact a function which can be associated with that part. Which is more or less okay if the way you're doing your science is the way you build your factories. And that has been true of us since the beginning of the 19th century. But it may not be the best way to understand what's going on in nature. As Immanuel Kant pointed out, in the first decade of the 19th century, when he said, look, we have no choice but to do science on the basis of mechanisms and identifiable discrete mechanisms which work together. But in fact, it will be much more accurate to do science on the basis of natural purposes 
and to think about what comes together in realising a natural purpose, which may not turn out to be exactly the same as a series of identifiable mechanisms. Now, for those who realise that Immanuel Kant always referred to Aristotle as the philosopher, uh, you begin to realise that his natural purpose is in fact a transposition into German, uh, which we've now had translated into English so we can read it, of the idea of telos. And the idea of a natural purpose that is actually an internal part of the complex interaction that's going on in order to produce a final manifestation picks up almost directly the idea of intellection, the idea that the natural purpose is in a sense realised in and a key to the whole functioning of a biological system rather than some end towards which it is aiming as its what we now call final purpose which again, of course, is much more appropriate to the Industrial Revolution. What am I building this machine to do? That's, its, that's what it's designed for. It's designed to do something. So the idea of design and the idea of final purpose are conceptually very, very close and have a very clear kind of application to a mechanistic understanding of what's going on. When we move into a biological understanding, to say exactly what causes what and how that all figures out in a chain of causes producing a final result is much less clear we continually strike, as we might expect, just by looking at its provenance, the chicken and the egg problem, of which came first. And Kant actually says, look, when a natural purpose is working itself out, you can't just say this step causes that step, or this bit of the mechanism causes that bit to work a certain way. Cause, cause and effect are reciprocal. The effect is actually feeding back in to the process doing the causation in a way that it affects how it goes after the thing we call the effect has become identifiable. Uh, to whatever means we're using of detecting it. Um, so if we take some of this complexity back into the reconstructed student's notes attributed to the philosopher, we begin to see that the straightforward question of whether the mind a term coming into prominence after Descartes as the key to human nature, but before that, not isolated and put in such a preeminent position, that identifying the mind with either the heart or the brain might be a process uh, full of traps for the 20th century scientific uh, interpreter. In fact, the two authors mentioned at the t in the bullet point one pro produce a kind of overview, an Ubersicht, of the whole production of thought, the flow of thought, that led 
to Aristotle's uh, writings. And notice that delimiting which parts of a human being um, actually subserve the various aspects of the function of a human soul, a human living being, is not something that takes a lot of prominence until the natural study of things, their parts and their constituent movements starts to become a prominent part of what we now call natural science. So we might not actually expect to see anything quite as clear as what it, contemporary scientists might be looking for when we read these writings. In fact, these two authors, both obviously Italian, writing on classical literature and classical science, argue that Aristotle's ideas have got to be seen against the background of a sort of unitary idea of the functioning of any organism. Now, they use the word abstract, but in its kind of technical sense. So that doesn't mean fuzzy, that, some, that means more abstracted from or distilled out of as the key bit of our thinking in relation to a thing of this kind. Yeah. So if we're thinking about a living thing and lining it up with all other living things, in contemplating that lineup and reflecting on it, reflecting what's in common, what overlaps, what is perhaps not common to all, but is common to most, and in some other way realised by the others, we abstract an idea of what it is we're talking about when we talk about life. Now that isn't just sort of getting a vague sort of, well, it's the kind of vibe of the thing, kind of idea about it. It is actually abstracting something that for the purpose of reflection about the nature of things, about the species of things that are real, about what types of things are real, will then be an adequate or reliable guide to thinking. That's the purpose of abstraction. And again, we see the idea of abstraction submerge for a while because God solved that problem for a lot of the medievals. The divine illumination gave human beings the capacity to intuit or understand or take from experience an idea of the essences of the things they were dealing with. Um, and so you could then just move on. Take what we intuitively regard as the essence of life or the essence of intellect or the essence of anything uh, and work with that as a guide to clear thinking and don't worry yourself too much about how it is we can do that because God gives us that. And of course, the man who sets himself to understand the workings of God, no disrespect to theologians, is just on a wild goose chase. Well, not quite, unless you worship wild geese, but um, <laughs> is the kind of thing that might rapidly run you into mysteries that you your human intellect cannot adequately deal with. 
So the question as to whether the seat of the intellect has a specific locus in the human body then becomes something we are projecting back into this body of scholarship rather than something that is necessarily to be found there in the way we think about it. Um, where, for instance, is the intellect that enables you to do up your shoelaces? Well, nowadays, people talk about things like muscle memory. And we think, well, there's a mashup, if ever there was one. We all know that the memory is something to do with the brain, and specifically the hippocampus in the medial parts of the temporal lobe. So what do you mean by muscle memory? Well, just try writing yourself a prescription for doing up your shoelaces and realise how much it is muscle memory. Or try doing up your shoelaces with gloves on. And you'll suddenly realise that a lot of the guide to the perplexed about doing up shoelaces is in the hands, the practised hands, not some kind of intellectual operation. So we need to kind of slightly look askance at the seat of the intellect. So now we get to the debate. Are we going to go for encephalocentrism about the human soul? Or are we going to go for cardiocentrism? Well, at this stage it becomes irresistible to produce the one-liner you have to produce if you want to be seen as wise. It's not that simple. Because the moment you say that to anybody's question, they immediately realise your knowledge of the subject goes a whole lot beyond there, and they're seriously in doubt whether, about whether they can take the great deliverances of their own intellect and break it down into terms sufficiently simple for you to grasp, so. But we do have some guidance. We might have to refine it a little bit from a simple statement, but it's not a bad place to start because it's Aristotle's teacher. So given that Aristotle is famous, for having reacted against or critiqued or moderated a lot of the teachings of his teacher Plato, but retained some key features, some of which trouble natural scientist Aristotle scholars even to this day, uh, because Plato famously argued that the human intellect must have an eternal aspect about it because the truths it grasped were eternal. You just can't have a square unless you've got a plane figure bounded by four sides. And it doesn't matter if we're thinking what New Zealand will be like in 2027 or 2050. A square will still be a plane figure bounded by four sides. That, in a sense, is an eternal truth. And there's a part of our mind that grasps these constant things. And mathematics is a prominent part of it, and logic was thought to be the other part, to the point that Bertrand Russell uh, and Russell Whitehead, when they wanted to emphasise the immutable nature of mathematics, as huge doubts were being uh, formulated at the beginning of the 20th century, aimed in their work to ground mathematics and logic and uh, the law of contradiction. Uh, 
a thing cannot be its opposite. So if you have a thing and its opposite, you have two things. Right? And build from there. Plato was famous and enunciated a theology based on the idea that the body was a temporary receptacle for the soul. That souls existed and pre-existed their embodiment and therefore they also post-existed their embodiment, which happened to be a very comforting thought that even when you die you just don't vanish. Um, there's a sense in which you remain. And of course, as a religious thought, many people held on to that. And Christianity became extensively Platonized um, as it interacted with Greek philosophy because Plato really suited a pre-existing form of yourself, you, the specific individual who was you, existed in God's mind before you were born, became embodied as you when you were born, and will, of course, be taken back to God when you die. And it will be the one you, through the whole business, it's not that the earthly you dies and another you gets created or anything, there is a continuity, because if that were the case, then, of course, how can we tell that it really was you and not just a devilish copy of you who was deluded into believing that he was you. Um, that would be an impossible problem. Uh, but Plato's theory kind of suited. Aristotle's was a whole lot more difficult. Aristotle reacting against his teacher argued that in fact all of our ideas about everything we encounter in the world arise from our encountering them. We have very experiences. We abstract from, we derive truths that are constant from one experience to another and truths that help us to contrast one event or object with another. These contrasts and abstractions condensations, we might say after Freud, these things are human constructions. They allow us to make sense of the world. Of course, if we are going to be successful, the way we make sense of it better be very close to the way it is. Otherwise, we'll constantly trip over because things are not as we thought them to be. So this kind of fitted an agenda uh, in which the eternal or heavenly realm of forms, intuited in some way through divine illumination, was not required to give an account of human knowledge. An account still had to be given of how it is you go from the specific instances to the right kinds of generalizations. But Aristotle had thought about that. He said, well, you do it by training. People point things out. You think, oh, that's another table. Look at all the other things that you've been instructed or trained called tables. Kind of figure out the basis on where, I mean, even a computer can do this, so it's got to be a pretty dumb thing to do, but, and kind of figure out what it is they've got in common. And then just in case there's doubt around the edges, you get into a process of argumentation. I'll buy a table, do you mean something with four legs? No, because then a giraffe would be a table. 
But if you've ever tried to use a giraffe as a table, you'll realise that it doesn't really work. I'm so a table is not a giraffe, but they've both got four legs. So the principle of being a table isn't just that they've got four legs. This is an argument. It is gradually honing or refining your idea of a table from a number of possible candidates that you might entertain just based on taking what's common between the various experiences which seem to get labelled that way. But Aristotle's identification of the intellect with the head was something that, I mean, Plato's identification of the intellect was something in the head temporarily visiting the earthly realms of bodies was not going to go unchallenged by Aristotle, like everything else that takes. Plato said. What he also did pick up and went on to reproduce was the idea that there are various aspects of the soul, three in particular. There's an intellectual or sometimes he says social and political aspect of the soul. There's um, a bodily um, a a motile or effective aspect of the soul, an animate aspect of the soul that we share with animals. And there's a vegetative aspect, a self-nourishing, growing, self-sustaining aspect, which we share not only with animals but also with plants, but we do it in very different ways. What is unique to us as human beings is this intellectual or socio-political aspect of our characteristic form of life. Uh, and of course that again could be transmuted in a certain way, looking at it through a platonic lens to suit the doctrines of the medieval church because they wanted the human being to have something distinctive which set human beings apart from animals and plants. So we can kind of move on and see what kind of a take we can now get on Aristotle's mistake. Now Gross, uh, an English-speaking writer, writing on uh, German actually, writing on this topic, um, makes the follow makes the claim at the top of the slide. He systematically denied the controlling role of the brain in sensation and movement. Okay, that sounds pretty straightforwardly bad. Until you read the remark of the Pueblo chief immediately underneath it. And in fact, notionally run it past any indigenous commentator who's going to produce something very much like what this Pueblo chief said to Carl Jung, Freud's famous successor. You white men think with the brain. That accounts for your shortcomings. We red men think with the heart. Gross acknowledges that actually when you look at all of Aristotle's writings insofar as we have them, it's pretty clear that the heart and the brain work together in some way. The heart gets you pumped, the brain cools you down. And when you're totally pumped, that's not totally conducive to clarity of thought. 
as most of us who've got married realise. Um, but if your brain just cools you down for long enough, or if somebody else takes that role like your parents, or a wise group of friends, if you're lucky enough to have them, or brothers and sisters who can weigh up the possible partners and give you a slightly different focused take on them. Getting all pumped up might not be such a bad thing after all. It might get you going in the whole process of living a decent life so that something is going on that can then be moderated, cooled down, made to be a bit more inclusive, not so much rushing at the fences. In fact, Aristotle conveys very much that idea. Man's brain is the largest and moistest brain for its size, for the size of the human body we infer, although this is the form that it was translated in. For man's superior intelligence depends on the fact that his larger brain is capable of keeping the heart cool enough for optimal mental activity. Now here, of course, it's almost irresistible to slip into a metaphorical sense of cool. The sense of cool that goes with thought, reason, looking at things in the cold light of day. Um, something we still talk a lot about. So if we do take seriously this doctrine of entelechy, that the purpose and form of a human being are kind of living things, united together, forming a whole, and that psychological faculties quite many and varied, including memory, perception, cognition, um, emotion. Psychological faculties are ways of abstracting from or putting together in a certain way uh, that the whole activities of a living organism. So then we have to take a step back and ask ourselves, okay, so what is a soul or a psyche? The answer is very clear in Aristotle. It is a form of humanity. Oh. And of course, it's got physical aspect. Human beings have a certain shape or morphology. It's also got kinetic or kinesthetic aspects. Human beings move in particular ways. Most clearly seen when you observe <coughs> the mode of moving of a human being who's been raised by animals. They're usually social animals who, who, who occupy a dominance hierarchy like wolves or dogs or something like that. And when you look at the somewhat grainy videos of the two Indian children rescued after being raised by wolves, you suddenly realise the most striking thing about them is they don't move at all like human beings. They in fact move like wolves, to the point that they even eat their food like wolves. Even if they are served their food at head height, as they eat it, they go right down and take it down into their gullet the way a four-footed wolf would if it was crouching to swallow gobbets of meat. So the idea that the psyche or the soul or the living form of a creature is in some sense separable from its whole integrated function as a living being 
is actually a somewhat later transposition onto Aristotle, inevitably infected by the spirit of the Enlightenment in Descartes at its origin, the beginning of what philosophers call mod modern philosophy, uh, where the separation of mind from body is taken as a metaphysical uh, ground. Actually, the idea didn't survive uncriticised for that long. Uh, by the beginning of the 19th century, Immanuel Kant was already pointing out that it had so many flaws you couldn't possibly believe it. Uh, Descartes' separation of mind from body and therefore you find passages in Immanuel Kant that are much more reminiscent of Aquinas and Aristotle than they are of Plato. Uh, and so here again we see this tripartite form that Aristotle and Plato both shared. But we see written behind it, or over it, or framing it, in Aristotle's thought, this idea at the bottom, that the human soul makes us the things we are, formed from within, for interaction with the world of experience and possible action. This, this is holistic. Part of it is being able to do up your shoelaces. And there's no particular reason to think, except for the Cartesian hangover, that a blueprint for what you do when you do up your shoelaces should be carried in something abstract called the mind. If you're not a Cartesian, why would you ever believe that? If you're a Cartesian, then of course everything your body does is in some sense an outworking of a blueprint that already exists in your mind. But if you're an Aristotelian, no, that's not the case. Your mind is manifest through your integrated living function which has these parts to it. And they become inextricably intermingled. Some of our minds are almost completely taken up by what we read in cookbooks. So how does it so we can't think of the mind as something entirely different from our vegetative functions because in that activity they both are inextricably interwoven. So if we we are to think of a human soul as a way of thinking about a living thing, then it's going to have certain things to it that a living thing has. It's going to grow for a start. It's going to start off with a seed and it's going to reach its full form. And Aristotle talks about this in terms of potentiality and actuality. He had observed it. He'd seen it in the human embryo. He'd seen the anatomical, what subsequently came to be called analogia entis, of, of the growth of the human soul, the analogy in physical being of this beginning from small beginnings and reaching a highly developed and complex form that we know is true of our psychological life in the narrow sense, but there we just see a kind of a repeat of what's going on, or a reiteration of what's going on in a physical sense. Um, I won't divert us into four causes, but Aristotle is famous for enunciating the fact that mechanistic cause of the type that dominates in a Victorian factory and that contemporary scientists tend to think of as the only kind of cause, except we're having to revise those ideas, was only one way 
of answering the question, why is this thing like that? And all causes are ways of answering that question, why is this thing like that? And in fact, there's different kinds of answers. Because the processes that were going on a moment ago made it like that. Now that's kind of efficient cause, productive cause if you like. Because it was always going to turn out to be an oak tree. Because it started off as an acorn. And if it's going to be an oak tree, its leaves are going to end up looking like this, its branches are going to have these kind of shapes. It's, it's a kind of, it's necessary that it turn out like this. Otherwise it wouldn't be an oak tree. You know. And that we could call it a final cause looking at the unfolding of form over time, or to fall in with contemporary embryology, animal embryology, we could call it a formal course. That little bud coming out of the top of what is going to become the torso turns out looking like that because to take up its proper role in the whole thing of which it is going to be a part, that's how it has to turn out. Um. So formal and final are, are, are slightly different because on one sense, on, in the blueprint sense, the final cause in a sense is, is what goes into the design of the thing if you work by blueprint. Whereas formal is much more what happens to a thing because it is part of something else. And that, we're now realising in biology, is, is incredibly important. You put a bunch of sheep cells into a living human being, and after a while, if you don't look at the DNA, they'll turn out to look exactly like the human cells. Uh, that make up the rest of the body that they are now part of. So we could think of the soul as the kind of driving force or means of differential energization and configuration and the final destination insofar as it enters into the whole process of becoming a thing of that kind, of the thing whose soul it is. And in fact, uh, when we take this particular view of the nervous system, I've talked about this before, uh, we get to uh, a view which we can associate with somebody writing at the very end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, John Hewlings Jacks who very much argues that, um, now I'm going back to forwards here, that uh, the form that any particular neuron takes within the whole network that is the human brain is because of the role it has to play in the whole. Oh. So let's revisit Aristotle's mistake. Let's take it for granted that he believes in entelechy that there's a sense in which the soul is present and manifests itself in the unfolding of a body, of the body, the soul of which it is. The body is, in fact, the um, soul clothed in matter or embodied. Um, we can see that there's a kind of unity about this. That once an organism has completed its process of integrating itself and growing, and doesn't just have various bits which do their own thing, there's an integration of activity. 
It kind of tells you something about what kind of living being it is. And if you're a human child, but you've been raised by wolves, then your mode of being is betrays these formative influences. Or your form of life, the form that you have come to realise, uh, shows its own roots. Um, we can contrast this holistic view of the soul, uh, that a human being is an embodied soul, rather than that a human being is a body with a soul inside it, uh, with the view of Plato, and later of Descartes, and therefore we can deny the inherent Cartesian materialism the mind is separate from the body, but we now know that the mind is the brain, so the brain is separate from the body and, in a sense, and controls it, so it can be analysed differently from it, uh, and therefore it is right to say that the mind is located in the brain, not in any part of the body like the heart. Whereas the moment you go towards the more holistic, entelechy view, that starts to become a very problematic statement. Part of being human is living the life of a human body. Making the kinds of connections and relationships with the world that human beings make and that wolves don't or chimpanzees for that matter, even though they're very close to us in some neurological respects. We can just set that aside, deny it, and say, yes, the soul is as much a part of the whole body and the way it conducts itself in the world, how it reacts to things and so on, as it is a part of a, an isolated bit of it, like the brain. Yeah. So I want to reiterate my slimy answer. Wow, did Aristotle believe that the mind was in the brain or in the heart? It's not that simple. That dichotomy arises from a somewhat anachronistic reading of Aristotle that takes us away from the idea of living soul as, as whole embodied beings to a post-Cartesian idea that the Christian church in its full power political power happened to find really, really convenient as a philosophical ally and enshrined in Western philosophy from the early modern period onwards, which was that mind and matter were different metaphysical kinds. <laughs>